Well, good afternoon. It's great to welcome you to Exploring Catholicism. One of the great things about exploring Catholicism is to see the way in which the Holy Spirit is continuing to bring about the great gift of Jesus Christ into our hearts, minds, and souls. And today, as we film, we're stepping into the month of June, which is the month of the Sacred Heart, the month of Corpus Christi, the month to just really allow ourselves uh, to allow the Holy Spirit to put us in rhythm with the heart of Christ. And I'm joined here, co-hosted, new flavor to the show today, by my dear sister-in-law, Regina, who, speaking of heartbeats, have a heartbeat inside of her. As one of her famous children once said, where's your baby? And the, ba and the boy, the little boy said, he's in your belly. Exactly. So it's great to have Regina Dunahu here joining me as we get to welcome a tremendous guest uh, in just a couple minutes in which we will we'll bring her on. But I thought that I would just uh, lead a little prayer that's in the back of a book that we're going to be getting into. I call it St. Patrick's Breastplate. And it's something that I wake up to every morning. And so I thought it was providential that perhaps we would start into this by just going into prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this is what St. Patrick wrote. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through a belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth and his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion and his burial, through the strength of his resurrection and ascension, through the strength of his, strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. I arise today through the strength of the love of the cherubim and obedience to the angels and service to the archangels in the hope of the resurrection and to meet with reward in the prayers of the patriarchs and the preachings of the apostles in the faiths of confessors, in the innocence of virgins, in the deeds of righteous men. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in the ear that hears me. And so we ask for the intercession of St. Patrick, one of the great saints of all time, and our dear St. Joseph during this year, to bless this show. And the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it is truly a grace to, to be able to welcome uh, to a program a, a tremendous author. I love Regina, how she prides herself of being like a philosopher. She's a theologian. She's an editor. But also, she's a great mom and a tremendous woman. And so it's just so great to be able to see all those facets come together. What's your interest? Like, why are you here? Like, what's your interest in Carrie Gress, our great uh, uh, program person today? Well, I'm here with a lot of gratitude because <laughs> Carrie has been my favorite, one of my favorite Catholic writers for a few years now. And what she does so beautifully in the first book I read of her, The Anti-Mary Exposed, is she kind of draws out the lies that are in radical feminism. And she points to kind of where women are caught in between two poles. And I think a lot of us growing up feel caught and we're not really sure where the freedom is. And so she spells out this lie, but she does something that a lot of writers never get to, which she provides the antidote. Mm -hmm. She provides the freedom and it's in our blessed mother and it's in the Catholic faith. And whenever I read the book, the first parts of the book, you're kind of like facing a lot of things. And in the second part of the book, you're just filled with so much peace and so much excitement to go out and be the woman that God created you to be. And then she continues this antidote with theology of home and allowing and encouraging women to find the eternal meanings of things in daily life, in the mundane. Um, and it's very powerful. It's very freeing. And I just admire um, the way that she's been able to integrate that into her professionalism and as well into just her daily life of being a mom. And you've done something similar, right? Uh, in terms of your work with pro-life, your work with some of the secondhand stores you work with and juggling all your children, right? I don't. I wouldn't put myself quite in the same category, Father Jay, but I appreciate the comparison. I think that we are all trying as women to figure out where God is calling us. And so much of the writing in Carrie Gress's work just kind of allows us to figure out where has God created me to be whole? Where has he created me to express my feminine genius in the world? But first, where is he and how is he creating me 
to express that feminine genius in my home, with my family, in my, in my vocation. That's fantastic. So as you can imagine, I'm just thrilled to be able to welcome to our program, Dr. Carrie Gresson, as she comes on the screen here. I hope that all of us are able to be able to recognize behind the scenes, she has several kids. She's got a whole construction project going on in her house. <laughs> Carrie, if any of those things happen, we're ready for it. <laughs> well, thank you. Show well, thank like, you. Like for me, when I go to church and mass, I celebrate mass, and I hear kids crying and moms scrambling, I always see that's our future children choir. This yeah. Fantastic to have noise and ruthlessness in our churches, whether it be Cheerios being thrown at each other, a kid storm raging the altar. I think it's just fantastic to have the chaos of kids because it's to them that the Lord uh, has them. Carrie, welcome to the program. Just a quick question for you. You love Mary so much. Who's your? What's your favorite image of Mary? Is there a go-to image where you really have found? a deeper uh, relationship with her, or is there something, yeah. an image that you really tend to really go to Mary image? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to thank you for having me on. This is really fun. I actually, I love Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> when I went to Steubenville, I, I, I got teased a lot because like every other day I was driving to Pittsburgh because I just couldn't take Steubenville. <laughs> so <laughs> I was always, you know, trying to find the best coffee shops and use bookstores and um, you know, it's before GPS too. So I spent a lot of time getting lost in Pittsburgh. So anyway, I, I just love the ethnicity. Um, but as far as our, our Blessed Mother, you know, the one that I have really developed a devotion to is um, Our Lady of Star of the Sea, um, mm -hmm. Stella Maris. And part of that is because well, I got married in a Star of the Sea church. Um, one of my first books was inspired in the Star of the Sea church, Stella Maris church down in um, Sullivan's Island in South Carolina. So she just kept ap appearing, but she also, it's one of the oldest devotions. And I, I feel like, you know, the world is so chaotic that we just need this constant star to, to guide us. And, and that's what it really feels like. So, uh, you know, we've taken it a step further. I actually have a line of candles that are named after her, um, Stella Morris and Company candles that uh, about five years ago, I guess, um, I was looking at, I was looking at these great soy candles and, I, you know, I turned over one of them that had been given to me as a gift and it said, you know, all proceeds go to animal shelters and, um, you know, f fine enough causes. But I thought, why aren't Catholics making these? You know, we have the best art. We have the best sense, um, you know, the way things smell. Why can't we use some of these in, in soy candles? And um, so I asked around a little bit at other people could, you know, if other people were making them and finally came back, you know, in prayer that my husband and I were supposed to make them, which is pretty funny because I'm the least crafty person I know. I, I'm allergic to crafts. Um, so <laughs> we are now making them in our house. In fact, um, I, we just poured another 200 of them over the weekend. And it's just been amazing how God has really bl blessed this effort because people get them for their friends. They get them for family members. They have them blessed and then they give them as gifts. And it, it's just amazing to hear the stories of, you know, how our lady is working through these candles and, and people's lives. So we, we put that up. Is that the correct uh, link that people could get to? Yeah. It's on your theologyofhome.com yep. website under exactly. collections. Yeah. Okay, great. Hopefully yep. we'll encourage all of our people. Do, are those candles also, are they fitting for like home masses? So sometimes I'll do Oh, masses in Regina's home. Would that be a fitting yeah, candle you know, outlet we, for that or no? They would. We have um, some actually that are made with a chrism scent. Um, so in fact, I just talked to um, one of the Nashville Dominicans who said that she, um, they have one in their chapel and every morning they walk in and they can smell the chrism as, it, as it's burning. So um, I have another priest in St. Louis that just ordered a bunch for um, Easter. And um, so, yeah, I know that they, they have been used liturgically as well. Um, so anyway, it's, it's been a really fun journey, just, you know, trying, we're, we're working on one right now, um, on, with Spike Nard and we're going to call it the Magdalene candle and really just try to evoke that sense of, you know, so many of us relate to Mary Magdalene and that desire to, to wipe Christ's feet clean, um, with the Spike Nard, like she did at Easter or before the, the crucifixion. So anyway, I think, um, you know, there's just so much richness there. So we're really trying to, to put that in people's hands in a very, very tangible way. That's powerful. This morning I was talking to one of our dear parishioners. They just had a girl and they named the girl um, uh, Madeline after Mary Magdalene, uh, Magdalene after Mary Magdalene. And so it's good to hear her name again twice in one day, even though we're after the Easter council, it's always good to invoke St. Mary Magdalene, especially in a discussion that we're going to jump into. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Carrie, can you give a little bit of a, a background to how you see 
the feminist movement, how it developed a second, especially mm -hmm. that quote unquote second wave feminism yeah. that has been something I think uh, of an adversary to um, what I would say St. John Paul II saw in feminine genius mm -hmm. and obviously is the exact opposite of the image that Mary, uh, that the Holy Spirit brought to us through Mary. Yeah. Just to give a little context for right. uh, the book of Anti-Mary, mm -hmm. which we'll get into a minute. But I think sure. for me, when I've heard you speak to this, mm -hmm. um, it's been interesting to hear how you have seen this supposedly movement that was supposed to help women actually enslave women. Right. But anyway, could you talk a little bit yeah. about that, you know, the 1960s movement of yeah. feminism and where you see that in terms of some of the books and things that you've been writing? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I dug a lot into the 1960s and j just trying to see what, what, what was happening, what was going on. Obviously, I wasn't alive at that stage. Um, and what, you know, we all know that there's an ethos in every age and that there's kind of a spirit that, that take, you know, the gestalt um, that, that sort of takes over a, a period. And um, so I was really interested in what, what happened in the 60s. And um, I was just amazed to see kind of this repeated pattern come up over and over again of, um, women both embracing Marxism um, as well as the occult. Um, and, you know, these two really just kind of between those two things blending together, which I, I lay out extensively in, in the book, um, as well as the use of media. I think that that is a piece that we just can't overlook at all. It's just the power that um, women like Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem, the, the way they used the media for their message, because um, they looked great, they were very stylish, they were very attractive, they're very well spoken, um, and so the message just really took off. Um, that you know th they had the route to to really achieve happiness, and um, you know it ends up being this very schizophrenic relationship with men, where you know women are told that they have to, in order to be happy, they have to be like men. Um, but then men also have to become more like women. And so they they really got to this point where, you know, women um, were considered the priority, but only women that were much more like men than what women are. So it, it was all kind of a, a, a jumbled mess. And yet um, those are the ideas that really took off. And it, it's amazing, you know, to even to see today that, that the, um, the sound bites and the arguments that they make are really the same. You know, I haven't had to change that much because they've had so little pushback um, from certainly those of us in the church and from the culture at large that, you know, they can still say, blame things on the patriarchy and everybody's like, oh yeah, the patriarchy's fault, you know, without even questioning, well, what do you mean it's the patriarchy's fault, you know? Um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's an interesting to, to thing to see just how, you know, I was shocked to see how diametrically opposed they are to Our Lady. Um, cause initially I just thought maybe they're just kind of listed a little bit to the left. And then the more you look into kind of the underbelly of all this you see that really it there's there's marxism there you know this idea of making women um kind of robots and or you know robotnik is that that soviet word of, of worker um you know where you're you're unencumbered by children and you, you just work um much like men and um so we can see that really playing itself out now and how unpopular it really is for women to say that they're a stay-at-home mom or you know we feel like we have to sort of justify it with added things that we're doing or something, you know, that that's not enough. Um, and I think that that's the, these are all just the, the afterburn of what happened in the sixties that just keep, we keep adding fuel to it and allowing ourselves to be, you know, fed this lie over and over again. Yeah, and it seems like uh, overall that part of this feminist movement is to try to portray anybody like you or my sister-in-law here as kind of some type of handmade, you got your bonnet, you're barefoot <laughs> pregnant, and you deserve to be stuck in a kitchen with a little right right. apron around you, wondering yep. if like you understand the world outside. And so yep. anybody who would actually study, be able to articulate any type of idea, obviously that's, mm -hmm. you know, so could you speak a little yep. bit to that kind of maybe how you have felt uh, <laughs> from being forced into a box about being a woman that doesn't yep. seem to actually go with your identity? Yep. No, I think that that's a great point. And that's one of the things they've been so successful in doing because they control the media, the fashion industry, book publishing, TV, politics, Hollywood, all of that. They've really made it this, just this closed system where it, if you're an outsider, they just they, they just sort of bounce off of them or they can, can either humiliate you or they ignore you um, is usually how it works. Um, and so you don't hear other voices. And so most women have no idea that there's really another way to even think about their womanhood, because this is just, you know, this is what we've been told, what I've been told, Regina's been told since, you know, 
the earliest stages uh, of our life, probably not from our, our parents or necessarily, but from the culture, the culture is telling us this. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's definitely a challenge, but, um, you know, one of the things that's been really interesting, I had someone come, um, to me, a, a professor after this book came out and she said, how can you get away with writing this? And I said, I can get away with writing this because I don't have a professorship anywhere. I don't, nobody can fire me. You know, if I get, <laughs> if all of this goes away, I still am a stay at home mom and I'm very happy, you know, raising my children. And this is, you know, all sort of wonderful and, and a blessing to be able to share this, but this isn't the, the be all end all of my life. Um, so I have a, a, a real freedom um, that unfortunately I think a lot of women who do have um, jobs that they can be fired from aren't aren't able to speak up in the way that I can. And I think that that's, you know, makes it all the more incumbent upon those of us that have this kind of freedom to speak out. Um, but yeah, it's it's always very interesting to sort of see the, the reaction because, you know, I do have a PhD in philosophy and I think more than anything, it's, um, I've seen, I'm seeing more people ignore my work rather than um, try and ostracize it because it, it doesn't go well, <laughs> partially because it's usually, it's, you know, most of the research I've done is pretty watertight um, and they're not used to pushback either. That's the other thing is they're so used to everybody just agreeing with them that they don't know how to respond to people that are actually pushing back against the, those arguments. Um, and you, you, you find very quickly that they don't, they, they've never really thought in any kind of depth about it. So um, yeah, I think that that is one of the things that a, a lot of us have going for us is just this capacity to recognize that there is this great weakness there. Um, and if you can, you can share some of these ideas or even live these ideas in a, in a radical witness um, without, you know, poking people in the eye or being rude or, you know, what have you. Um, I think those are Im important things that we need to do is just to remind and help other people know that there's another way to live than, than what the culture is telling us. So jumping into the book, uh, the first thing that struck me is that it was banned on a couple of the social media outlets. <laughs> outlets. Yeah. And as I read it, I'm like, well, this is a book that trying to contrast or give a kind of a, a contrast. There's an antichrist. And you say that as well, obviously, that there's mm -hmm. actually a spirit of an anti-Mary. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking it's published by Tan Books. It and it has a picture on the front, obviously it has some interesting images on it, but it's basically people are going to a march for life. What uh, the women's march? The women's march. The women's what, march. Yeah. Sorry, it, it was like yeah. what? <laughs> what happened there? Could you take us briefly through yeah. the the storyline on that? And what was your experience of being banned on some of these social <laughs> media books? I mean, you look like you're definitely yeah. a radical to our culture. That <laughs> yeah, you know, we exactly. have to be Very careful dangerous. about you. <laughs> Very dangerous. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, it was really interesting because this book came out two years before it was banned. Um, so it wasn't like it just came out and it was some kind of splashy thing that they were trying to prevent. You know, it's been out for two years. Um, and the, the, when what, what happened was that Instagram and Facebook both their own, obviously, by the same by both by Facebook, but um, a local a store down in Florida was trying to post the book on the marketplace at Facebook. And Facebook said, you know, this book violates our community or community standards or something to that effect. And um, so they sent that image to me and I was like, what, what's going on? You know, this is they've already had sold it previously. Other people have sold it on Facebook and Instagram. And so I just thought maybe this is just a fluke. Um, and then later that day, they tried to do the same thing on Instagram. And sure enough, Instagram wouldn't let them post it either. Um, and, you know, we looked into it on several several different ways with the publisher and just trying to get to the bottom of it. And then the bookstore was trying to get to the bottom of it. But it happened, you know, three or four days after Biden's inauguration. So, you know, the timing was odd. Um, then what also happened was people were really angry and bought the book, you know, by the boatload. And um, so the book went up to, I think, like 232 out of all of Amazon's books. And um, at that point, they sold out of the stock that they had at Amazon. But you know how when you order a book on Amazon, it's not in stock, they'll just say available, you know, at a future date and that date's listed and you can still buy it, but it, you just know it won't be delivered. Well, they actually took that piece down. So you could buy it from secondhand sellers and those actually ran out quickly, um, but you couldn't actually buy it for like another week. Um, and, you know, it could have been a fluke, but they would put it up and then it would come back down and they would put it up and it would come back down. Um, so I think what they were actually really trying to do was make sure it didn't get into 
like the top 100 because it was number one on feminist theory, um, which was just, or it was number one or two, I can't remember, but it was just amazing to see the books that were right next to it because um, they were just the epitome of, you know, the anti-Marian spirit. I think one of them was a nearly naked woman, you know, with some of the imagery of Our Lady of Guadalupe, like a total blasphemous image, um, you know, right <laughs> next to my book. Um, so anyway, again, you know, I don't, we don't have proof. I don't know, you know, how much all, who knows how much of these things were, were a glitch, but it was just interesting. Again, it's a, it's a two-year-old book and all of these things are happening within the first week of Biden's inauguration, at, like the same week. Um, so anyway, it, it raised a lot of eyebrows and it got a lot of attention and, you know, it was great for the book in terms of just giving it a, a second life. And we're actually, it just um, has been translated into Spanish and we're trying to oh, get that out. Um, as quickly as possible, um, as I'm, I think it's really important for that population um, to know, you know, how they're they're being abused um, and and taken advantage of, and you know, and left unhappy. So, anyway, but yeah, that that was just a, a crazy couple of weeks. And you know, at a certain point, someone was asking me questions about it, and I was like, look, I, I don't know, I, I'm not paying attention anymore. <laughs> like, I have a I'm homeschooling, I've got five kids, I've got a business, I've got books to write. You know, I don't have time to like stay on top of big tech and um you know the publisher has done a great job with it and 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 handled it well and um you know it's like i said it's been great for the book but at a certain point you just got to move on and um you know live your <laughs> live your life um and and pray that it doesn't happen but of course it's it's you know it happened to ryan anderson's book shortly after that and um but i really think it was the the subtitle of, with toxic femininity in it that that was what um was what, what tipped it off um rescuing the culture from toxic femininity. But I do think a lot more people read the book as a result of that. So yeah. maybe, no, maybe there's does. a silver lining. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, you spoke earlier about this kind of diametric opposition between the two mm -hmm. stories that are presented about women. There's mm -hmm. this radical feminism and then the authentic femininity that is really presented by the church. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is common ground that we can find between those two versions? And if so, mm -hmm. how do we go about finding that common yeah. ground? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great question. And that's a, um, you know, it actually leads into my second book, Theology of Home, um, because I think that there are so many women who are really struggling and suffering and unhappy, and they don't know why they're unhappy. You know, I was one of these women, like why I'm doing everything that the culture tells me I should be doing. I'm, being assertive and aggressive and I'm reaching for a degree and I'm being ambitious and outspoken, you know, all these things. And, and I'm miserable. And, um, and I think that we can see that in what I call the happiness metrics, um, everything from, you know, depression rates, substance abuse, suicide, all of these point to really un unhappy women. Um, so I think that that is an actually a, a real place to start. And, you know, certainly the pandemic has, I think led people to be open to thinking about things that they probably wouldn't have thought about before because they they feel the fragility of life in a way that they didn't feel it before. Um, so I think all of those things play into it. But again, these conversations can't really happen um, without a, being a context without a context of knowing people and and really loving people. Um, and that's the hard part. You know, this isn't just um, you know sidewalk street corner evangelization. This is really. Um, what women do best, which is get to know each other and love each other, you know, no matter where you're at. And I think, uh, you know, so many of us have families like this and are in situations with our, our families and in-laws or cousins and, you know, people that we work with and whatnot, that we have close relationships with them. But we also sometimes wonder, like, what if they really knew what I thought about this? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that's one of those things that when you have that trust that you're building up through that relationship, at some point, they really will know what you think about things because it will come up. Um, but it's not always a place to bring it up in, you know, those early moments of meeting somebody. Um, but I think that's the other, you know, that's why Theology of Home, I think, has been so successful and um, such a great resource for women, because we all have homes. We all long to have beautiful homes. And, um, you know, no matter what our gifts are, we can relate to the idea of, of having a home. Um, and it's obviously very popular in the culture right now. I think especially more with the lockdowns, people really want a sense of a sanctuary and a safe place and, you know, just the amount of money that's been spent on renovations. In fact, I was just reading this morning, there was some um, builder site that the number one search on their site, like by 95% was home extensions because all these people want to add to their homes. And, you know, we're going through this huge um, seller's market right now. And anyway, so I, I think the, the, 
the point is really just finding that place or those places that we have in common with other women um, and and creating trust and and love through those common places instead of you know starting out with a jousting like your radical feminist like you know how wrong you are like those aren't the places to start um so anyway and that's the beautiful thing that i th think women have the capacity to do is be compassionate and loving and see what people's needs are and and address them and loving ways that that are that's what really transforms hearts instead of just the um the apologetics or even just the the um the debate. Um, and that was a really hard lesson for me to learn because, you know, I have a PhD in philosophy. So I just thought I could just debate people into the truth. And, you know, I, I learned that very quickly, the hard way many times um, that that just doesn't work. Um, most of the time, it's, it's, there's, it's a much longer trajectory, and it just takes a lot more of yourself and self giving and love and listening, um, than really t telling people what to think. So a lot of empathy, a lot of interpersonal mm -hmm. relationships. Okay, very good. Yeah. Now, yeah. I, I do want to ask you, you are providing a guidepost for so many women um, on how to approach femininity and what to think of femininity. And you've been such a source of wisdom in that arena. I'm wondering, who were your guideposts mm -hmm. and how did you come to discover yeah. Yeah. that this was really your calling and what you love to write about? Yeah. Well, that's another funny thing, too, because when I was in graduate school, I was like, I am never writing about women. I don't want to write about women. I hate women in this issue. Women's philosophy, like I'm I'm not doing it. Um, so the the funny part was, though, that when I had I guess I just had finished my my Ph.D. and finished my dissertation. And I had this one insight one morning um, that, you know, I just kept as a new mom. I probably had two or three kids at that point, but as a, a new, younger mom, I thought I kept thinking that it was going to get easier. Like just next week will be easier. <laughs> next week will be easier. And of course it never got easier. You know, there was always something new, whether it was the flu or teething or, you know, you name it. Um, and finally I was like, Oh, it's not going to get easier. And it's not supposed to be easier. Like I just noticed that this is how God transformed me from, you know, narcissistic, shallow young woman into something much more beautiful and open and virtuous. And, you know, it, it's it's how he transforms our will. It's a very natural way that God transforms the hearts of women. And um, I started really looking around, trying to find women that I, I, I wanted to be like. And I, it was really hard to find role models. There was one woman in particular. Um, she was a, just this amazing woman. I think she had six kids and then a huge number of grandchildren and now great, great grandchildren. And she had a home on the Chesapeake Bay that she would open up to people and she had um, retreats there and things like that. So I actually didn't live that far from her. So every now and again, I would just go spend the night at, at Mamu's house. That was her name, Mamu. And um, she, it was in her eighties and, you know, she's, she, she looked like her name should be Mamu. She was a larger woman and, <laughs> and yet everybody wanted to be around Mamu. I mean, she was just infectious and she had this great, you know, almost like girlish laugh, but just so dear and so wise. And, you know, I could just sit and listen to Mamu for days. And um, anyway, Mamu died um, probably about 15 years ago now. Um, but she, just what made Mamu Mamu? And, you know, so much of that was, again, um, just her faith, obviously, but also um, she, you know, she lived through the Second World War and she just raised children and she was just so virtuous. Um, and that just really shone sh through who she was. So, um, you know, she was really a, a, a guide for me um, in so many ways. But yeah, I think it's I can think it can be very challenging because uh, a lot of my friends and people that I know, you know, I've had friends say to me, I I'm afraid to tell my mom or my mother in law that I'm pregnant again because mm -hmm. she, you know, she's not going to be happy that we're having our fifth or sixth or seventh or, you know, on and on child. Um, because there is that kind of pushback because the culture has been saying for so long that, that, you know, you can't possibly be happy. You know, children are really the impediment. So anyway, yeah, it, it's been a long, long journey. Um, and I know certainly our blessed mother has really you know, interjected herself in, into a lot of this. And there's, you know, a wonderful woman like, um, certainly Edith Stein and, and Alice von Hildebrand and, you know, just amazing women that have written out there. But I don't think that a lot of the work on women, and this is why I didn't want to do it, do work on women. I didn't think it was accessible. And I, it wasn't, there were very few books that I was like, I could give this to anybody I know and have them be amazed and engaged in it. 
that like I just didn't find those kinds of works. Um, and that's what I really wanted my books to feel like was that I could give it to, you know, anybody I know, especially Theology of Home. I, I've mm -hmm. given that um, so many different people and they've all really gotten something out of it. So I, I think that that was my reaction to it was the Catholic faith has so, so much, so much beauty, so much that it has given to us and, trans, you know, I know transformed my life dramatically. Um, I would never give it up for anything. And yet other women don't know this. Why, why are we not telling other women about this in a way that they can hear it? Um, so that's really been my goal is how do we package this in a way that feels compelling and fresh and lovely and engaging instead of full of jargon, tedious, you know, um, inaccessible and, and hard to, to get through. Um, which is not to say that it, there isn't amazing work being done academically. There is, but it's, we're very top heavy. We just haven't found a way how to get that, you know, trickle it down on a, on a popular level so that other women can absorb it very, very easily. Well, I think you managed to accomplish that, especially because you have the combination of truth with beauty. And both of those things are expressed so perfectly in Theology of the Home, especially. Yeah, no, and it was a fun project um, to photograph. We, we joke about how it's full of pictures that you're not supposed to show, you know, <laughs> lots of, you know, dads, dads looking like real men and um, pregnant women and lots of kids and, you know, all of that. So it, it's been a, a really amazing project to, to be involved in. We're actually working on a third one right now, um, Theology of Home at the Sea, um, cool. which we just went out to California and took a bunch of pictures out at the beach with um, Noel Maring's family. So that was great. And um, so that's going to be a, a fun one that will come out, I think, in next um, winter. Um, but yeah, it's it's just one of those projects that I, I feel like at some point it I'd love to have it become a magazine and something that, you know, our faith is so rich. We have so much to be able to offer, whether it's, you know, if we did a quarterly one, you know, you could do a seasonal one with all Lent and Advent and Christmas. And, you know, we have so much that's so rich um, on the food level and fashion level and home level that I, I can really see it happen. And it's actually kind of shocking when you realize that there's about 35 million Catholic women in the United States and we don't have anything on a, on a broad scale for Catholic women. Um, we've got some things, but people just haven't invested in. I think we don't see that you change the culture through these popular products. Um, you know, this is why the, the, um, the feminists have such a hold on us because they have all the popular products. Um, in fact, I was talking to a school teacher this week and she was saying, you know, what a challenge it is to catechize eighth graders. And I said, yeah, because they go, you know, to, at the end of the summer, they go watch movies about um, adventures and the plan B abortifacients, <laughs> you know, that there's just so it's packaged so well, everything against the faith that, that we need to start pushing back more and, and add it, you know, providing alternative. And that's also what we're doing with our store. Um, there's not really a Catholic lifestyle guru, you know, there's no Joanna Gaines um, that you can point to and say is, is, is Catholic. And yet, it, you know, these are really important things for Catholics to have the very tangible things. We know stuff is important, um, as George Weigel likes to say. Um, we know that the, the tangible is really important in, to our faith and our homes and our lives. And so it's, you know, this isn't some way to just make money. But in fact, it is a very important evangelical tool, I think, um, in, our, in our daily lives. Do you have any wisdom on how to communicate these themes to children mm -hmm. um, and maybe at different ages um, and how to inspire authentic masculinity mm -hmm. and femininity in our sons and daughters? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great, huge question. I mean, the biggest thing, obviously, is just living it um, and giving them role models to see. And I think that's one of the things that's that's hardest. In fact, Noel Marrying, my co-author, and I talk about this a lot, that it's just hard to find role models. It's hard to find people. We, you know, we have a lot in the culture. There's a lot of young women, both in the church, um, both evangelicals and then, you know, in the secular world of young women who are very charismatic. They're very attractive. Um, they they carry themselves well and they, they speak beautifully, um, but they don't have the formation to really carry off what, the, the kind of um, influence that they have. And so then some storm comes along and they're just crushed by it. Um, and, it, you know, they end up being ushered out, you know, that or they're teaching heresy or, you know, there's, they're just not formed well enough. And I think that that's one of the the big struggles that we have is, um, you know, how do we promote those who are really solid and, and, and healthy and, and ordered. Um, but, but I think it also has a lot to do with just even on that basic familial level, you know, being around other people that are 
holy, other families that are holy. So, you know, that, that parish community is really invaluable. And I think that that's a hard piece, especially now with COVID and social distancing. And, you know, hopefully some of that is, is coming back um, in small ways. But it, it, I think that's the, really an important element is just those building up a community and being around other people that embody what true masculinity is and true femininity is and, and providing role models for, for our children. But yeah, and, and there that's not to say that there aren't great resources out there either. I think that's the other amazing thing is we do have a lot of um, new things coming down the pike, probably in the last 10 years, um, even actually within, you know, I've been publishing books now, I think for five or six years. And even since when I started, you know, initially children's books where nobody was publishing them. And now um, a lot of places are publishing them. So um, attitudes, I think, about children and catechesis and certainly homeschooling have um, really changed and kind of, you know, up their um, their game a little bit um, in terms of, of reach and and what's available to, to help us with our, our work as parents. If you, uh, you know, when you talked about uh, your book here, The Anti-Mary Exposed, which I encourage everybody to get a copy if you can actually buy it off of Amazon. I think it currently <laughs> is available on Amazon. But you talk a little bit, um, or could you talk to a little bit, a bit about how you structured the book? I, I believe the first half is kind of as a tough, um, just mm -hmm. really a brute look at what's going on. The yeah. second half gives a lot of hope. And then obviously your theology of the home gives the, the greatest anecdote to it all. But could you talk a little bit about the overall structure of it, what you're trying mm -hmm. to yeah. um, achieve and, and just being able to weave this whole theme of the um, anti-Mary exposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when I started this book, I knew I, it had to be two parts because I didn't, I've read so many books and I'm sure you guys have read them too, where you close the book and you're like, that was so depressing. I have no idea that I'm, the world's going to end, like go find a cave kind of thing. Um, and I didn't want to leave people with that. I really wanted to, to give some positive attributes of who Our Lady was. And, and I think that that's been something that we haven't done a great job of either. Um, you know, I, I'm friends with Mark Mirabale and a, a lot of really great Mariologists and they have such amazing content. And I was like, how come we're not putting that content, of, you know, in, in places where women can read it in a way that they can read it? Because um, you go to Marian conferences or, you know, it's it's usually not populated by a lot of young women. It, it just isn't. It's, and um, unfortunately, and so it occurred to me, like, how do I make Mary accessible? Because so often we just think of her as very, um, she's distant from us, or she's kind of one dimensional, or she's just a, you know, pious statue in our churches. And, uh, you know, how do I make her feel like a real person to us? And I, and I know I struggled with that, you know, most of my life, feeling like I really could relate to her. Um, so anyway, yeah, the first half was really hard and painful. You know, it was two years of research. And I can't tell you how happy I was when I didn't have to keep looking up every demonic source and you know, all this awful <laughs> content on women. Um, but the second half was was actually quite fun because, um, I, you know, you, you've mentioned earlier before we, we got started, just that I, I focused on these three elements that women know about themselves or that drive women. Um, one, we want to do the good. And, and this is what's interesting about looking at radical feminists is they think that they are doing good. They think that the things that they're doing are actually fundamentally good. Um, they just are wrong about them, unfortunately. Um, but that's an impulse that women have. Another one is to be known and loved um, and to have the dignity afforded to that who they who they are. Um, and then the third one, of course, is, is beauty. Um, what a vital piece that is and how disordered we have have, you know, we've really twisted that um, that concept of beauty and not we don't understand what it's for. You know, it's what it what it really is for is for us, for people to see God in us. Um, and to help point the, the way to God. And that's what Our Lady does with her beauty. In fact, um, when I was researching my book, The Marian Option, I was just overwhelmed by how many times I read, you know, every apparition they said it was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. Um, you know, St. Therese says you would you would die just so you could see her again. She's, she's so beautiful. Um, so those three pieces came together. And it was after I turned my manuscript in that then I went and um, on a trip with my daughters and um, we were in a hotel room and someone had said, oh, you should watch the Hallmark Channel. And so sure enough, we watched two movies that night. And then one of my daughters got sick in the middle of the night. So we watched a third movie. Um, and by the end of that, those three movies, I was like, I got it. But 
the whole their recipe is is what women want you know exactly what i had laid out in my book the desire to do good you know it's that woman who's going home to save the library and <laughs> she meets the boy next door or you know that they're long lost um classmate or whomever um so she's got the you know the, that desire of being known and, and loved and she's always all she's doing you know very chic and all of that so that's the recipe and that's why they're like laughing all the way to the bank because um they they know the heart of women um but obviously our lady knows it better um lives it better shows us better how how to live it um and all of that just comes back to again she has all of these things and she is all of these things because her will is so united to god um, and that's not something that's inaccessible to us. That's something that we we can have and that we can do and that we can be really um, through the sacraments, through the church, through confession, through what the, what the faith gives us is that accessibility to a real relationship with God where we're known and loved as his beloved daughters as we are. Um, so anyway, I think that's that's the exciting piece that we need to, to communicate. And that's what I really wanted to come out in that second part was you know, I'm just not here. I'm not just here saying, isn't she beautiful? <laughs> or isn't that a lovely statue or telling stories about her? But I wanted to be able to connect that really to the to the true hearts of women um, and, and what we all really long for and desire to, to have in our lives. Carrie, how would you express what or who the spirit of Anti Mary is? Mm -hmm. I, uh, you begin this book yeah. by saying that in the early 1970s, 12 women, uh, probably pre taking from the biblical 12 of the apostles mm -hmm. of the tribes of Israel, sat around and said, why are we here today? To make a revolution, a cultural revolution, by destroying the American family. How do we do that? By destroying the American patriarch. How do we do that? By taking his power. How do we do that? By destroying monogamy. How do we do that? By promoting promiscuity, eroticism, prostitution, abortion, homosexuality. And this came from uh, dear Mallory Millette, who I believe her sister was one of the, the real brainchilds behind the feminism movement. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of describe uh, what you see maybe even today through some movements mm -hmm. that truly are the anti-Mary? Yeah, no, I, and uh, this is a great question because I don't mean it as an individual. Um, St. John in one of his letters talks about a spirit of the antichrist. And that's what I mean is it's a general spirit that is sort of taken hold of, of many women. Um, in fact, one of the exorcists I talked to said, you know, this isn't something that we would be vulnerable to if we weren't sinful, but because of our sins, it we were opened up to this, this kind of anti-Marian spirit. Um, so it makes sense from that way. But um, yeah, that quote came from um, Mallory Millett, who was Kate Millett's sister. Kate Millett was on Time Magazine. She wrote the, the horrible book, Sexual Politics, that, that landed her on Time Magazine. But also, um, really a foundress behind all of the, um, the the women's studies programs in our universities. Um, that's, you know, one of the, the classic textbooks is to, re to read that book. Um, and what you can see, what, what happened with this, you know, it, it's amazing to think about the, the women saying that back in the 1970s, because none of those things, you know, that you read that last line again, um, eroticism, abortion, homosexuality, prostitution, those are not things that were t openly talked about or promoted or, or part of the culture, really. I mean, certainly abortions happened and prostitution happened, but these weren't things that were up and coming. There was no pride day, you know, that this is all new. Um, so they were quite possibly just think about how dr how radically successful they were. You know, I've got these 12 women in New York City um, that just unleashed because, again, of all these these this the culture was ripe for it in so many ways. Um, and the, the lies that they told and the media and, you know, again, all of that. Um, so successful in, in terms of using that, you know, anti-evangelization or that, you know, evangelizing their own awful message um, and how much it spread. But it's really, you can see how the, those pieces are really the cornerstone of what has happened with LGTB movement. Because if you don't have radical feminism, you never it would end up with the LGTB movement and that idea that that gender is fluid and can be changed and um, sexuality is somehow connect, disconnected from um, fertility. Um, you know, all of those pieces play into this. And so you can see kind of these pieces building on it um, and and really exacerbating, um, you know, the brokenness that, that we already have and making it more, you know, broken people break other people. Um, and that's definitely what we have, have seen um, with radical feminism. So, 
Yeah, it's it's amazing what a foothold it, it has, and um, you know, just the the confusion that it has sown about what it even means to be a boy or a girl or man or woman. Um, you know, all of that started right there in that that room with those twelve women. Um, so it's it's pretty scary, but I think it's also really help, hopeful because it means if they can do that with just twelve women, you know, think of what we could do um, if so many of us really embraced Our Lady and the church and God's will and um, united in, in fighting this. In fact, I was watching a video just last night about the patriarchy and it was just one of those things. It was like, how do, how have we allowed this lie that that men and the things that men bring to the culture, which is, you know, protection, providing and procreation. How is that we have allowed this lie to perpetuate itself so long that that just was a construct to oppress women? You know, why why have we accepted that? So I think it's just pushing back on these lies and saying, you know, we're not going to accept this anymore, um, but also finding new ways to communicate that through, again, things that are beautiful and compelling. Um, and 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 pushing against the culture um, instead of just trying to use it apologetics or something. Yeah, I agree, and I think uh, I love how you talk about uh, in in one of the parts here, anti Mary or anti Christ, anti Mary, and you go into Mary has she reverses Eve's rejection, mm -hmm. and as um, one of the saints said, uh, as a woman brought humanity under the power of Satan, one theologian echoes early, uh, um, God would liberate humanity with cooperation of a woman and. Isn't it true, at least for me it is, I see it in my own family, I see it in our community, that women truly do unleash an incredible amount of influence in our mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. And when it's claimed and done out of, of love and care for and out of a, a deeper experience of the Lord, it can create and be so incredible, but the opposite is true. So you either have <laughs> these 12 women doing that or you have yep. women like you or Regina going against that culture mm -hmm. to really try to allow the Marian, the pro-Marian influence of women to, to, to speak to its heart. What has been the reaction from other colleagues or other people across mm -hmm. the, uh, your landscape there, uh, Carrie, with this book? Um, you know, actually, it's really interesting. Um, one of the most interesting things was to just see um, the reaction of some, some family members when I was, I was on the cover of um, the front page of Russia Today, and uh, one one family member, a male family member, sent it out to everybody, and you know I was shocked because I had done a TV show with them, but I didn't realize it was going to be on the front page of it. Um, but it was interesting to see the, the the males were all really supportive, and you know go carry, and uh, and there was crickets from so many of the women, and um, so it's just really interesting to me, I think, to see how. Um, again, just what, what, a, what a grip it is that, that the culture has on women. Um, but yeah, I, one of the things I really would love to do is actually um, write a book similar to this, but have it actually be more from a, to a secular audience. Um, I know that the, the Mary piece is obviously really hard for Protestants to, to stomach. Um, and, it, you know, people just don't, don't get it necessarily. But I think so many of the ideas of it just translate so easily into people's lived experience of what we see in the culture every day. And, um, you know, just the narcissism and the, the anger and the bitterness that's, that so many women um, are expressing every, every day that, I, and people are, are trying to figure out how to grapple with it. How do we, how did it happen? How do, why does it continue? Uh, you know, how do we, how do we protect our sons? How do we give men a voice back? You know, all these kinds of questions I think are still um, continually asked and, and raised. And I think this book answers it, but with a title like the anti-Mary, you're, you're only going to have a limited amount of, of, of people that would read it. So I've actually started some, some, um, a manuscript to, to start working on a, a more secular one again, and not backing away from who our lady is and the role model that she is, because I think that this is, you know, the big irony is that this idea that women are equal came from Christ, but it also came from who Our Lady was and the dignity that is afforded to her and just people recognizing who, who she is as the mother of God. Um, that's really where they, why the idea took off. Um, so anyway, I, I think that that would be something that I would love to, to publish in the future. And hopefully if I can squeeze out enough time from my schedule over the next couple of years, I can get that, that out. But um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's been just really interesting to see, you know, who's interested and, and who's not. But I think and I, the other thing I will say is that I was very gentle to men in this book. Um, in fact, one woman pushed back and said, you know, why? Did you, why aren't you blaming men for all this? And I said, well, we've blamed men for 50 years now for everything that's wrong in our culture. I think that there's room for one book to not 
like try and squash men. Um, and to just look at our role as women in, in the culpability factor um, related to what, what's happened with the culture. Um, so anyway, it's, it's um, been interesting to see who's picked it up. There's a, a weight lifter that um, does, he's actually a Catholic convert. He does a lot on trying to promote real masculinity and femininity. And he ended up doing a, a shout out on Instagram about it. Um, which was just fantastic, but you know, it was just point. And actually at one point I, he used some of my language in a, in a video that he, he did on the topic. So it's great to see it, you know, in little ways, um, having an, an influence out in the culture, but yeah, I'm a, I, it's been, it's been really nice to see. I think that men appreciate it, but they also come away from it, from reading this book, um, seeing women with a new kind of compassion. And, and, um, you know, a lot of times I think men feel a lot of resentment towards women, when they actually see how systematic this has been and how much we have, we don't even realize how much the wool is being pulled over our eyes, then I think that helps them have a compassion and pity towards us that, you know, previously was just irritation and, and resentment. So um, hopefully that's been somewhat healing for, for people as well. Well, I, I think one of the things that you're pointing to right now is the difference of the voice of the radical feminist movement that mm -hmm. kind of tells women and traps women in a way that they're really susceptible to falling, to say, mm -hmm. you should, you have to, this is what you are, mm -hmm. which is work and all of these kind of negative things. And then contrasting that with the voice of God that says, will mm -hmm. you, I love yeah. you. Like right. you are you are made for heaven, you are made for eternity. Right. And um, calling, calling that out and, and giving women that sense of freedom with mm -hmm. God's voice is, I just yeah. think, so powerful. And I'm wondering what your advice is to kind of search for that voice. If we mm -hmm. find ourselves caught in between those mm -hmm. two narratives, yeah. how do we find the voice of God and right. where will we notice it in our lives? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic question. Um, partially because one of the things that we're so confused about is what does it even mean to be a woman? Um, you know, there's a, there's a video <laughs> of some women at the women's march being asked that question, you know, what does it mean to be a woman? And their, their answers are hysterical, you know, they're not trying to be hysterical, but they're hysterical because they don't really have an answer. They can't, they can't define women. Um, and I think most of us would be really hard pressed to, to define women because we just don't have positive answers or role models or a sense of even what our, our womanhood is. And, um, you know, that's one of the things that we did in our second book of Theology of Home was really look at what does it mean to be a woman and dig into this idea. And, you know, one of the things I loved, and it's, I touched on a little bit in the anti-Mary too, is um, is just this idea of Mary. I mean, of of women as carrying things, um, not just to carry them as a burden or to carry them, you know, be, to be a burden, but because we, when we carry them, we also transform things. And um, you know, this is you pregnant and um, nuns carrying our prayers and offering us back to God through their prayers. Um, you know, what a gift we have both in virginity, but in motherhood and also in spiritual motherhood, all these different ways that God allows us to embrace others and transform them for the good and, and give them back to God. And so, um, you know, I think it's really exciting to start looking into what, what does it really mean to be a woman? Uh, you know, even we can see this in the language of the church. The church is called she the church is a building. Um, the The name of the church is named after um, the word ship, which again, they're feminine words. They, they carry things. Um, so I've loved just this aspect of it because it's it's just great to have sort of these, these powerful visuals and, and ways to understand who we are, um, but also to see that that receptivity. Um, I love the, the concept of it was given, this idea was given to me. I'd never read it before, but it was given to me in prayer. And I just was able to compare how you know, a woman's body biologically, spiritually, it sort of expresses itself in a similar way. You know, the, the woman receives the, the um, seed of her husband. She's usually the first one to know that she's pregnant. Um, she then carries a child to birth. Then she basically works herself out of a job um, to give this child life and, and to become a mature adult and live on their own. You know, it's typically how it happens. Well, it happens exactly that way on a spiritual level, but we don't tell young women this, that God means for you to receive him. He wants to give you gifts that then you help bring to life. And we have these great examples of someone like, you know, Mother Teresa. Um, she had that very tiny idea. She had to go to India and help the poorest of the poor. And of course, look at what happened. You know, she worked herself out of a job because she gave birth to this, this whole 
um, missionary work. And then when she died, you know, the, it carries on. Um, Mother Angelica is another example of that. Um, but I think that that happens for all of us on, on all, it can, can happen for all of us on all these biological, of course, but spiritual level. And we're not open and aware of that aspect. Um, so I think it's these exciting and beautiful ways that we can start seeing women in a new light instead of just this constant comparison to to men, which has, has gotten so tedious and, and tiresome. Um, and I, I think women want real content. Um, and that's one of the fun things we're, we're actually doing with our, our next book, with um, the, the Theology of Home at the Sea book, is really comparing um, women to the ocean and, you know, just all of these to this great imagery that's that's in the ocean. You know, there's a lot of great depth and mystery and there's also storms and there's also calm and healing and peace. And uh, just drawing that out to help women have a stronger sense of, of really who they are, because that's what's missing in the culture. You spoke earlier of how we don't have a lot of visible role models. And I'm just listening to your last answer. I'm just filled with a lot of gratitude that those saints in heaven, while we might not see them on the cover of a magazine, they work pretty hard to call out to us yeah. and to yeah. communicate with us in some really special ways. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we might still have the upper hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have them and we also have their witness in their lives. And that's, of course, you know, the beautiful thing. And and I think one of the reasons, I, you know, I'm at, at some point I really want to do some research into the roots of feminism in, in general, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Protestants don't have the saints. They don't have female saints to model their lives after. Um, and yet we have them in so many different ways and arrays and just the, the, the different ways that God created female saints um, and use them is, is so beautiful. Um, and I think that that is, can be so telling about where God is calling us, you know, the ones that we're attracted to and that speak to us as well. Um, certainly our lady is, is, is among them or, you know, the, the model of, the model of models. Um, so yeah, there's, there's certainly a lot to be said for that and the importance of, of reading their biographies and, and, and writings too. As we conclude here, I love uh, to talk a little bit about Our Lady of Fatima mm -hmm. and uh, just the, there's a phrase that you put there, she fights like a mom, referring <laughs> to Mary. And yeah. I know in the uh, if, if you're out west and you got between cub bear and mama bear, mm -hmm. that would not be good for you. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, on uh, May 13th in 1981, uh, St. John Paul II was in his, uh, you know, his normal routine of hugging children and being out there. Mm -hmm. And a bullet came right at him. And it was as if Mary protected, he puts that a lot on Mary that she mm -hmm. deflected the bullet. She protected him, she fought truly mm -hmm. <laughs> like a bomb for her son, John Paul II. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to uh, Our Lady of Fatima's role and in, 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 in what you see yeah. coming towards here and also about Mary's role about fighting mm -hmm. for her children? Yeah, well, and this I cover in a great deal if anybody wants to read a lot on it. Um, my book, The Marian Option, really covers this. And I, I talk a lot about Fatima in there in terms of just what Mary predicted, that the, the lies of Russia would spread to the rest of the world. And I think we often think of communism and so socialism in terms of economics. Um, and yet, as I outlined in this book, and, you know, even five years ago, it, it, it um, feels even more important now um, because of what we're seeing in the culture. But um, what I what I talk about in that book is um, how Our Lady predicted all that and how we saw in Russia what what they really tried to do was change human nature. They really tried again back to this idea of women as robots or the you know robotnik, um, the workers, um, and that that's the but the Russians rejected that because it was for outsiders that really you know came in upon their culture and so it has never really fit well. Um, but this is what the difference between what what's happened in Russia and what's happened in the United States is the women were able to usher it in through women like Kate Millett and, and sh make it an argument that was very compelling. And so it, it's, it just seeped into the culture in a very natural and um, just a, a, a stylish fad really um, that, that we've embraced. And now we can see that amped up even more, um, especially again with LGTB movement. Um, but now with Black Lives Matter, because it's all the exact same language of, you know, just how do we destroy the, um, the family, that the nuclear family, how do we um, promote Marxism? Um, also abortion has always worked into that, um, into that calculus. And these are the, the very lies of, of um, Soviet Russia was that human nature can be changed and we can make ourselves into whatever we want, want to be. Um, and, and that's the big lie, you know, human nature is static. Um, it doesn't change. You know, there are certain things that can be changed, but human nature is not one of them. And this is why we still read the Odyssey and we love it. We love the Odyssey. Um, there's so many beautiful 
pieces of that because our human nature hasn't fundamentally changed from these ancient Greeks. Um, so anyway, I think that that's, that's the one thing that we really have to be mind, mindful of and watch for is how is it, when are people trying to tinker with human nature? When are they trying to mess with the family? Um, you know, those are always the tell tale signs that you're in trouble and that, you know, this is not godly. Um, and actually my, my colleague, Noah, my co-author, Noel Maring has just written a book called Awake, Not Woke. Um, that really goes into the Black Lives Matter issue and really lays out from a Catholic perspective um, what the issues are, because a lot of it is very confusing and can feel like it's it has Christian roots, but it, it's confusing. Um, so she does an amazing job. So if people want some, you know, a, a way to build on this and see what what's happened with Black Lives Matter and, and the woke culture. Um, that's a fantastic resource to, to look into as well. Carrie, thank you uh, for taking time. I, I was hoping we get to see your children run through oh, and be well, there. Two of them are outside running through the yard and the sprinkler. <laughs> I, I just, with the warning, don't cut yourself. <laughs> I can't help you. So, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I, I yeah. love it. I really appreciate you uh, taking some time out today for both Regina and I to talk My with pleasure. you. We're big fans and um, I hope that uh, my parish and all that watch this will will be able to pick up any of your books really, but The Anti-Mary Exposed and then uh, The Theology of Home are just tremendous books as well as uh, what we just saw on Mary. You led me by looking at the back of Anti-Mary prayers to combat the Anti-Mary to a saint I'd never heard of before, full full disclosure, Saint Anna Marie, what's the last name, Taiji? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's Taiji. pronounced, pr depends, but yeah, Taiji is the typical pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Oh, my, what a, and, and she's an incorrupt saint. She's mm -hmm. was a life that was quite challenging and turns out to be the patroness of mothers and families and just about anything that's challenging, she'll take on. <laughs> so she's a great intercessor. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just finish by praying this prayer that you place in here. So that means the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Prayer to defeat the devil by Saint Anna Marie Taiji. Prostrate at thy feet, O great Queen of Heaven. We venerate thee with the deepest reverence, and we confess that thou art the daughter of the Father, the mother of the divine word, the spouse of the Holy Ghost. Thou art the storekeeper and the almoner of divine mercies. For this reason, we call thee mother of divine compassion. Behold us here in affliction and anguish. Deign to show us thy true love. We beg thee to ask the Holy Trinity most reverent, fervently to grant us the grace to ever conquer the evil of the world and of evil passions. The efficacious grace that sanctifies the just, converts sinners, destroys heresies, enlightens infidels, and brings all men to share the true faith. Obtain for us the great gift that all the world may form, but one, one people united in the one true church. Mary, Mother of Holy Hope, pray for us. Pray for us. Amen. Amen.